Many years ago, a co-worker organized a Christmas party for the office staff at the adoption agency that I worked at. The, the plan was simple. Everybody was to bring a tray of cookies to have a cookie Christmas cookie swap. So each person would bring a tray, place it on a table, and that entitled them to pick cookies from everyone else's trays. So you would end up leaving with as many cookies as you brought. Sounds simple, right? Well, it is, if you know how to cook. But, but what if you can't? What if you can't tell a pan from a pot? What if, like me, you're culinarily challenged? What if you're as comfortable in an apron as a bodybuilder is in a tutu? If such is the case, then you've got a problem. And such was the case. And I had a problem. I had no cookies to bring. Hence, I would have no place at the party. I'd be left out, turned away, shunned, disdained, dismissed. Feeling sorry for me yet? Well, that was my plight. And forgive me for bringing it up, but your plight is even worse. See, God is planning a party. A party to end all parties. N not a cookie party, but a feast. Not giggles and chit-chat in the conference room, but a wide-eyed wonder in the throne room of God. And the guest list, well, it's impressive. Have you ever wanted to question Jonah about his undergoing a gut check in the fish gut? <laughs> You'll be able to ask him. You ever wanted to ask Joseph if he ever looked up from his prayers to find Jesus watching? Well, he'll be there. Ever wonder what David sounded like when he played the harp and sang? He might be doing that. Ever wanted to size yourself up with Samson? You just might get a chance there. But more impressive than the names of the guests are the nature of the guests. No egos, no power plays. Guilt, shame, and sorrow will be checked at the door. Death, disease, and depression will be the black plagues of a distant past. Though we deal with pain and heartache every day, we won't be dragging that, that baggage to heaven. And what we now see vaguely, we will see clearly. We will see God, not, not by faith, not through the eyes of Moses or Abraham or David, not, not via the scriptures or sunsets or summer rains. We will see not God's works or words, but we will see Him. For He is not the host of the party. He is the party. His goodness is the banquet. His voice is the music. His radiance is the light and His love. And it's the endless topic of discussion. There's only one hitch though. The price of admission. To this party, the price is steep. In order to come to the party, you need not a plate of cookies. Actually, nothing you offer can get you in. To come to this party, you need to be righteous. Not good, not decent, not a taxpayer, not a churchgoer. Citizens of heaven need to be righteous. Right. R-I-G-H-T, right. All of us occasionally do what is right. A few predominantly do what is right. But do any of us always do what is right? Well, according to Paul, we don't. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Paul is adamant about this. He goes on to say, no one anywhere has kept on doing what is right, not one. And some may beg to differ. Hey, hey, hey Greg, I, I may not be perfect, but I'm better than most. I mean, I lead a good life. I don't break rules. I don't break hearts. I help people. I like people. And compared to others, I think I'm a pretty righteous person. I used to try that trick on my mom. She'd tell me that it, to go clean my room. And I would say, well, I, it is clean. And I would take her to look at my brother's room. I mean, his room was always messier than mine. And I'd say, see, my room is clean. Look at his. It never worked. Because she would take me by the hand and walk me down the hall to her room. Now, when it came to tidy rooms, my mom's was righteous. I mean, her closet was just right. 
Her bed was just right. Her bathroom was just right. Compared to hers, my room was, well, it was wrong. She would show me her room and say, this is what I mean by clean. Now, God does the same. He points to himself and says, this is what I mean by righteous. Righteous is who God is. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, does what is right. In him is no sin. The Lord is righteous. He loves justice. His righteousness endures forever and reaches the skies. Isaiah described God as a righteous God and a Savior. On the eve of his death, Jesus began his prayer with the words, O righteous Father. Get the point? God is righteous. His decrees are righteous. His judgments are righteous. His requirements are righteous. His acts are righteous. Daniel declared, Oh, God is right in everything he does. God is never wrong. He's never rendered a wrong decision, experienced a wrong attitude, taken a wrong path, or said the wrong thing, or even acted in a wrong way. He's never too late or too early, too loud or too soft, too fast or too slow. He's always been and always will be right. He is righteous. And when it comes to righteousness, God bats a 1.0. He never hits a foul ball. When it comes to righteousness, well, we don't even know which end of the bat to hold on to, quite frankly. And that's our plight. Will God, who is righteous, spend eternity with those who are not? Would Harvard admit a third grade dropout? I mean, if they did, it would be benevolent. But would it be right? And if God accepted the unrighteous, the invitation would be nice. But would it be right? Would He be right in overlooking our sins, lowering His standards? No, He wouldn't be right. And if God is anything, He is right. He told Isaiah that righteousness would be his plumb line, the standard by which his house is measured. As in my case, if we are unrighteous then, we're left out in the hallway with no cookies. Or to use Paul's analogy, we're sinners, every one of us, in the same sinking boat with everybody else. Then what are we to do? Carry a load of guilt? plod slowly, shamefully through life with this overwhelming burden of guilt? Many do. So many do. But this was never his plan, never his desire. Let's look at the words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. <laughs> Green pasture, still water, paths of righteousness. That certainly doesn't sound like a difficult stony path to me. If such a wonderful destination sounds like an impossible dream to you, I wonder... Could it be time that you hand over your burden of guilt to the Good Shepherd? Carrying guilt is like a child carrying a hundred pound bag. It's possible, but they're not going to get very far. Well, what if our physical baggage was visible? Suppose the luggage in our hearts was literal luggage on the street. The fellow in the gray flannel suit He's dragging a decade of regrets. The kid with the baggy jeans and nose ring, he'd give anything to retract the words he said to his mother, but he can't, so he tows them along. And the woman in the business suit, it looked like she could run for senator, but she'd rather run for help, but she can't run at all. Listen, the weight of weariness will pull you down. The weight of self-reliance will mislead you. The weight of discontentment discourages you. The weight of anxiety plagues you. But, 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 
the burden of guilt, guilt consumes you. And try as you might to outrun yesterday's mistakes, its tentacles are longer than your hopes. Sometimes your guilt and shame are private. Sometimes it's public. Branded by divorce that you didn't want, contaminated by a disease you never expected. Whether private or public, shame and guilt are always painful. And unless you deal with them, they can be permanent. Do you want to know how to deal with your guilt? Well, I got a story for you. It is a story of failure, a story of abuse, a story of shame, a story of grace. That's her, the woman standing in the center of the circle, those men around her, religious leaders. F Pharisees are called, self-appointed custodians of conduct. A and the other man? The one in the simple clothes sitting on the ground? The one looking at the face of the woman? Well, that's Jesus. And Jesus has been teaching. And the woman has been cheating. And the Pharisees are out to stop them both. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The accusation rings off with the courtyard walls. The woman stares at the ground. Her sweaty hair dangles, her tears drop with hurt. Her lips are tight, her jaws clenched. You'd expect Jesus to stand and, and proclaim judgment on these hypocrites, but he doesn't. Jesus begins to write in the sand. And then he says, anyone here who has never sinned can throw the first stone at her. The young look at the old. The old look to their hearts. And they're the first to drop their stones. And as they leave, the young, who were cocky with borrowed convictions, begin to do the same. The only sound that is heard is the thud of rocks and the shuffling of feet. And Jesus and the woman are left alone. Surely a sermon is brewing. No doubt he's going to demand that she apologize and repent. But the judge doesn't speak. His head is still down. Perhaps he's still riding in the sand. And when he looks up, he, he, he's almost surprised as he realizes that she's still there. And he asks her, where are your accusers? Don't even one of them condemn you? And no, Lord, she said. And Jesus says, well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He treated her guilt with grace. So what does that leave us? Our Lord is right, and we are wrong. His party is for the guiltless, and we're anything but. So what do we do? Back to my story, I can tell you what I did. I, I simply confessed my need. Remember the cookie dilemma? I was invited to a party, but the price of admission was a plate of homemade cookies, and I didn't know how to cook. I, I let the organizers know, hey, I don't know how to cook. I can't go to the party. Now, do you think the organizers had mercy on me? Nope. Did any of the staff have mercy on me? No. But an elderly secretary that worked in the office did. She heard about my problem. I don't know how. I, I, I don't know when. But just moments before the celebration, I was given a gift. A plate of cookies. Twelve circles of kindness. And by virtue of that gift, I was privileged a place at the party. Did I go? <laughs> you bet your cookies I did. I mean, like a prince carrying a crown on a pillow, I carried my gift into the room, set it on the table, and stood tall. Because some good soul heard my plea, and I was given a place at the table. And because God hears your plea, you'll be given the same. Only he did more, oh, so much more than bake cookies for you. What One final thought about the cookie party. 
Did everyone know I didn't cook the cookies? You bet I did, they did. I told them. I told them that I was there by virtue of someone else's work. That my only contribution was my confession. We'll be saying the same thing for all eternity. It was at once history's most beautiful and most horrible moment. Jesus stood in the tribunal of heaven, sweeping the hand over all humanity, he pleaded, punish me for their mistakes. See the murderer? Give me his penalty. The adulteress? I'll take her shame. The bigot, the liar, the thief? Do to me what you would do to them. Treat me as you would a sinner. And God did exactly that. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. So what happened with our sin? Well, we read in Psalm 32, 1, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. First of all, God forgives us our sin due to Jesus' sacrifice. The Hebrew word forgiven literally means to lift off. The, the image was portrayed in John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. Bunyan's protagonist, Christian was his name, was weighed down by the burden of his sin. When he came to the cross, the burden of sin fell from his shoulders, rolled down the hill, and disappeared into an empty tomb. See, unconfessed sin is a burden that weighs us down. But when we confess our sins to God, He lifts it off our shoulders, rolls it away, and it disappears. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Secondly, He covers our sin. This imagery is taken from the Day of Atonement. On that day, the high priest took the blood from a sacrificial animal carried it to the most holy place, and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. That was that box that contained the Ten Commandments. You know, the one Indiana Jones found. The sprinkled blood symbolically covered the broken law and shielded the sinner from judgment. When something is covered, it's hidden from view. So God puts our sin out of his sight. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thirdly, God removes our sins from us. How far does he remove our sin? It says, as far as the east is from the west. Curiously, you could start at the North Pole and begin to walk south, and you will eventually get to the South Pole. It's a measurable distance. But if you were to start walking west, you will never reach the east. You will continue to go west. The distance between east and west is immeasurable. And so God has removed our sin from us an immeasurable distance. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Fourthly, He washes away our guilt and cleanses us from our sin. See, sin leaves a mark or a stain on our soul that only God can wipe away. And it says here that He wipes it away completely. So we're left as white as snow. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Fifthly, he throws all of our sins behind his back. In a metaphorical sense, God puts all of our sins behind him so that he doesn't have to see them any longer. I've wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Sixthly, he sweeps away our transgressions. Our unconfessed sins hang over us like, like, like a dark cloud. But God promises to sweep them away like when the rising sun burns away the morning mist. I, even I, am the one who wipes away your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. 
It says He remembers our sins no more. When God forgives our sins, He forgets them. The omniscient one does the impossible and remembers them no more. Who is a God like you? who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion over us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Eighthly, he cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. God hurls our sins into the sea to the very deepest part. Do you know even today, scientists are not 100% sure how deep the ocean is? And that is where God has thrown our sins. And He's lifted up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. That is the grace of our Father. And it caused Micah to ask, who is a God like you? Having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He nailed our sin debt to the cross. God not only erases our sin debt, He destroys the document on which the debt was recorded by nailing it to the cross. So there's no evidence whatsoever of it. The path of righteousness is a narrow, winding trail up a long, steep hill. And at the top of the hill is a cross. And at the base of the cross are bags. Countless bags full of innumerable sins. These bags belong to liars and cheaters and a host of weary travelers. But not anymore. And your good shepherd invites you even now to lay down your bags. Lay down your guilt, your regret, your sleepless nights, every burden you thought you could carry on your own. Lay it down and let's start traveling light.